أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters and welcome to another session of Mizan Live um, last week we had a problem and there was a technical difficulty. Now in the beginning I thought it was um, on our part and uh, I tried my best to come online for the session last week but it just didn't go through. Turns out it wasn't our fault. It was, uh, there was, a, it was a, a worldwide issue that Facebook and Instagram and other other platforms, social media platforms were having. So that's why we didn't have a session last week. Um, unfortunately, uh, but of course for me it's fortunate, right? Because that's one week off. <laughs> but no, I was ready to go and uh, just didn't go through, unfortunately. So we're picking up this week, inshallah ta'ala, and inshallah there will be no problems. And we're, we're able to cover some uh, some more articles from the book of Doctrines of Shia Islam. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh Type them up in the comment section of this uh, video and I'll take them. Although usually we don't have too many questions when it comes to these discussions. Um, one more thing um, we just put behind us, I think, what time is it now? Yeah, it's like 7. About 2 hours ago, the spring began of the new year, of the new uh, solar year. And um, for those who celebrate the new year, no ruse. Uh, congratulations to them on that plus the fact that today also um, in, and, and on these days we are celebrating the, the Milad and Wilada and birth of Imam Ali as well so it's a nice coincidence that these two um, happy occasions have fallen on the same date so my, my congratulations to everyone out there and of course happy Father's Day to anyone out there who's a father so um Continuing with our discussions on the uh, attributes of God and the qualities of God. So I just want to go over what we covered last time. Last time we went through Article 37. Article 37 was a long article and you had four of God's uh, traits and attributes and qualities that were covered in Article 37. Number one was his knowledge. Number two was his power. Number three was life, and number four, his irada and his will. So I, all, each of these was discussed, not too much in detail, but the main points uh, Ayatollah Subhani covered, he gave verses for each of them. Um, and the, these were all, of course, attributes and qualities of his thought, of the essence of God. Okay, so I want to move on. I don't want to go over too much. Let me just take a look real quick here. Anything very important that was covered last time that we need to just go over? Not really. Yeah. Okay. So let's start, inshallah, this week. Uh, this week's session with Article 38. What is Article 38 talking about? Article 38 uh, moves from the uh, the qualities of God, the qualities of essence. It moves to the qualities of action that I've explained again and again before. What these qualities are. The qualities of God, of course, we said from one perspective are divided into two. The qualities of action, qualities of essence. Qualities of essence were those qualities that the essence of God was enough for us to be able to deduce those qualities from Him. Just understanding what God is all about, even if there's nothing else existing out there, God Himself is enough for us to understand that there's knowledge. God alone is enough for understand that there is power, and so on. That's one category. And the other category opposite to this is qualities of action. Qualities of action were which qualities? Those qualities that God's essence is necessary for them. But He has to actually do something for Him to be, to be attributed, those qualities to be attributed to Him. So for example, until God creates, you cannot call Him the Creator, Al Khaliq. So Khalq, Khalq is... It's a it's an uh, it's a quality that you can attribute to him once he actually creates. Yeah, you can't just attribute it to his essence before he's created. So these were the qualities of action. 
that God had. Okay, so now, having said that and reviewing that once again, so now let's get into Article 38. Article 38 and onwards discuss these qualities from Allah's action versus His qualities of essence. The first one that He covers here is takallum. Takallum means to speak and speech. So yes, the Qur'an describes Allah with this attribute that Allah speaks to people. So we need to, since it's in the Qur'an, we're not going to doubt the fact that Allah speaks. But at the same time, we want to know what this speech is all about. What is it like? For that, he brings the first verse just to prove that God has speech. It says, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَيُّكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهِ that Allah won't speak to anyone except through these means. So this verse, Surah Shura, verse 51, talks about God speaking to others. So this right here shows us okay, that He does speak. He speaks. But how does He speak? The same verse continues and explains. It says, إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابٍ أَوْ يُرْسِلَ رَسُولًا that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want to know how He speaks to others, so speech is an attribute of God, it has to do with His attributes of action, not attributes of His essence. If you want to know how this attribute of God works, this quality of action of God works, then what you need to do is see this verse, Shura 51, what it says. Three ways that Allah speaks to others. Number one, illa wahyan. Through wahi, through, let's call it inspiration, or sometimes revelation, at the end of the day, the recipient of this form of speech is the heart of an individual, not the ears of the individual. So, illa wahyan, Ayatollah Subhani, right there he says, wahyan, revelation, or inspiration, equals through the heart. Yes. It's interesting that in the translation, I don't see them put this word in here. But in the actual text, the Farsi text, it does have this word. So number one, wahyan, out of inspiration. And then Ayatollah Subhani adds this. It's not in the translation. Through inspiring the heart. So the recipient here of God's speech, quote and quote, of course, is the heart of an individual. So that's one. So for example, um, when Prophet uh, Musa's mother put him in that basket or whatever it was she put him in and put him in the river, the Qur'an describes that as us about Allah revealing to her and inspiring her to do, to do this. The word wahi is used. Okay, so wahi is for prophets and, uh, and others as well, not just prophets. Yes, so that's one way. Allah inspires them in their heart, I guess. Let's word it like that. أو من وراء حجاب Or from behind a veil. Okay, so here, it's not. it doesn't have to do with the heart anymore, Ayatollah Subhani explains. What does it have to do with? It has to do with the person's ears, actually. So Allah is speaking to an individual from behind a veil. In other words, you can't see God. Because as we all know, it's impossible to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's impossible to see God. So here the wording that's used in the Qur'an is from behind a curtain. Not that God is hiding somewhere and now you can only hear His voice. No, it's not about hearing God's voice while He's hiding. No, it's this is figurative speech here. Min wara'i hijab means that you don't see Him, but you can hear His voice. So for example, for example, when the burning bush incident an episode took place for Prophet Musa alayhi salam and he Allah speaks to him through that burning bush if 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 that's what it was then uh, this is the example for when min wara'i hijab min wara'i hijab now someone might ask does that mean God has a voice no once again no a voice or a sound is made that you know you can hear sentences doesn't mean that that's God's voice necessarily. Okay? Let me read what he says exactly, Ayatollah Subhani here. He says, Or from behind a veil. In other words, that that man or person can hear God's speech but cannot see him. 
And then in parentheses he says, God's speech to Moses took this form. Okay, so he doesn't explain any further here. That's all he says. Now the translation says God's speech. And that is a good translation for the wording that's used that I'm seeing here in the Farsi. Sohane Khoda. But that doesn't necessarily mean, I don't want this to be, this misunderstanding to take place, that God actually has, you know, vocal cords, and you can hear his voice, because he can make a voice with his vocal cords. No, a sound is made, the, and a voice is heard, and words are understood, and that is min wara'i hijab. That is what behind the veil means, okay? Aw yursila rasula, or he sends a messenger. Now this one you can say, uh, is the most famous one, of course, is the one that we know the most. Revelation. Revelation versus wahi in the beginning of the verse, um, where it was it goes to the heart. Here, God doesn't send, doesn't directly con- contact you through your heart, but He sends, like for example, uh, Angel Jibrail. Angel Jibrail comes down and He speaks to you and delivers the message. Oh, Yursila Rasula. So these are the three ways that God speaks. Quote, and quote, quote, unquote, again. I have to keep putting these quotation marks. God speaks to others. In other words, he says, an angel is sent by God to man to convey the inspiration. That's what the translation here says. Okay. <clears throat> In this verse, he goes on to say, the speech of God has been explained as having been brought into being by God, either directly without, inter- without an intermediary or indirectly through the intermediary of an angel. According to the first mode, or that first form, which was divine inspiration, which was wahi, which was to the heart, God sometimes casts his words directly into the heart of the Prophet, and sometimes he causes his words to enter the heart after having first been heard by the ear. In all three modes of speech, these diff- three f- forms, wahyan, min wara'i hijab, yursil rasulan, however, the words of God are brought into being. So God's speech didn't exist before. This is the point that Ayatollah Subhani wants to make, that these are qualities of action. That means they didn't exist. God did something, and once he does something, now you can attribute these qualities to him. He says, in all three modes of speech, However, the words of God are bring, bring, are brought into being. Excuse me. The speech of God is therefore to be considered as one of the attributes of divine activity, one of those attributes of action, not an attribute of essence. Okay. This is based on if we take the kalamullah and the speech of God to mean you know words and speech and communication and so on. Okay. But now. Now here Ayatollah Subhani points to another tafsir of the meaning of um, takallum or kalam. He points out something else here, Ayatollah Subhani. He says, there's another tafsir and another interpretation for kalamullah as well, and the speech of God as well. What is that tafsir? He says that tafsir is that the kalima and word of God equals the action of God itself. Or let's let's say it, let me say it even better, equals the creation of God. So, for example, a tree is kalimatullah, a river is kalimatullah. Anything that has been created by Allah is His kalima, and He says that the Quran refers to the creation of God and creatures of God as His kalimat as well. Look at this verse. It says Surah Kahf, verse one hundred nine. قل لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي لَنَفِدَ الْبَحْرُ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَنْفَدَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي وَلَوْ جِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِ مَدَدًا Which means, um, say oh, to the people that if the sea were to be, were the sea to be ink for the words of my Lord, verily the sea would be used up before the words of my Lord were exhausted. Even if we were to bring the like of the sea to its help, meaning two seas, you know, if all of the seas were to be ink, they would not be enough for the words of God. Well, what does that mean? What does words here mean? Does it mean that God has a lot of words to say, a lot of things to say, 
but we don't have enough ink to write them down. In this verse, he explains. He has he explains that he gives tafsir of this verse. He says it is clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't speak bishakil fam by opening and closing his mouth as if. No, that's not how Allah speaks. That's not a kalima of Allah. The kalam of Allah and the words of Allah, that's not what it means. Inna qawluhu fi'luhu. Verily, indeed, the word of God is his action and what he does. Wama yufiduhu min wujud. And the existence that he grants things. Yeah. Then why do we call it kalima? Why are these mawjudat and these creatures and creation of God that he, he, he brings into existence, why are they referred to as kalima? He says, what to sama kalima? We call it kalima because it's a sign. It's a sign that points to him. Okay, When people speak, that speech represents them. Right, brothers and sisters? That speech represents the person, is a sign of that person. It's an athar of that person. He says, this is why Prophet Isa salam was also called the Kalimatullah. Yeah? So now in the Christian faith, you will have that he, Jesus is the Word of God. The Being the Word of God in that tradition might be different than being the Word of God in the Islamic tradition. In the Islamic tradition, of course, based on Allama Tabatabai's uh, tafsir, in the Islamic tradition, Christ is Kalimatullah the same way a tree is Kalimatullah, is a sign of God. The same way a river is Kalimatullah. Now, Prophet Isa was a bigger miracle, of course, because he spoke when he was born, and there were other miracles that he had and did. But all in all, because he's a creature of God, he's a Kalimatullah. Yeah, some people use, I've noticed some of the, uh, some people from the Christian faith, sometimes they want to point out that the Quran takes inspiration from the Bible. They'll point out a verse like that. That look, your your Quran also refers to Jesus as the Word of God, so it takes inspiration from um, our holy book. <clears throat> and the answer to that is, look, our interpretation of Kalimatullah that Prophet Isa was is different than what you're understanding and the way you explain it. Uh, Salam alaikum to the brothers that are joining, brothers and sisters. Okay. That's why Alam al concludes. He says, and it's because of all of this that we can conclude that anything you find out there that exists, anything of objects in reality, it is a kalimatullah. Why? Because it points to him and is a sign of him. So if we take kalamullah to mean the creatures and the creation of God, not the words that he utters, so to speak, then we have a different meaning of kalima here. So kalamullah can be one of two things. Number one, it can be the communication that God has with people. It can be the communication He has with people either through their heart or through or from behind a veil or through a messenger that He sends. That's one. One meaning of kalima or kalamullah. Another meaning of kalamullah can mean that no, no, no. The creatures of God are kalimatullah. Okay, so now, having said all of that, they bring he brings a hadith. He brings a hadith that, um, until Subhanahu brings a hadith that echoes this understanding of kalima, that Allah's words are His action, what He does. So, in other words, He's trying to support with this hadith, Allama Tawatawai's tafsir of that verse. It says that Imam Ali Ali Salam has said. That Allah's speech and Allah's words, Allah's kalam are His will and His action. When He wants something to happen and He wills it and it comes into existence, that is His kalam. لا بصوت يقرع ولا بنداء يسمع It's not a noise or a sound or a call that is made by Allah and words that are uttered. No, kalam Allah, innama kalamuhu, this hadith says, verily His kalam, His words, Allah's words, fi'lun minhu, they're an action that it that come from him. That he creates. He he is the origin of and gives existence to. 
Okay, so this is the first um, quality of action of God, an attribute of action or divine activity, Kalamullah, that he discusses here. Now, as I said, he's going to go through two more, so that's a total of three, but these aren't all of the um, Sifatul Fi'l of God or the attributes and qualities of action and divine activity of God. There's more, but he discusses these three. This was the first one. So Article 38 had to do with the speech of God. Okay, Article 39 now is a continuation of 38. It has to do with what we covered in 38. Okay, so 38 said, Article 38 said that we have the speech of God and the speech of God can have two interpretations. Okay, I want you to remember that now that as we're going into Article 39. Article 39 talks about something by the name of Mihnatul um, Qur'an. Yes, this is something that happened in history, Islamic history. What is it all about? Well, he explains a little bit, then goes and he gives a little paragraph about the history of it. Let me read the paragraph that has to do with the history of it first, and then I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more. He says... At the beginning of the 3rd century, this is the 3rd century after Hijra, or the 9th century AD, the question of whether the Qur'an... So, so Article 38 was talking about the speech of God, right? So now we want to talk about the Qur'an specifically, which is also the word of God. So we want to talk about that a little bit. So it says, the question of whether the Qur'an was created or uncreated was being hotly debated by the Muslims. So you have this subject of, hey, is the Qur'an something that God created? Or is it something that has always been there? Just like God has always been there. This was a, this was a subject of discussion. Now for you and I sitting here listening to this, we're like, okay, that's not too important. But people lost their lives because of this. This is crazy. <laughs> In this, uh, this subject, this topic of hot debate of Mihnatul Qur'an is something that extended over the period of three Khalifas, Abbasid Khalifas, beginning with Ma'mun. And it went all the way till Mutawakkil, and Mutawakkil is the one who stopped it, and he put a, put a stop to it. But Ma'mun, he hung out with the theologians of his time a little bit, the Mu'tazilites, and they were of the opinion that the Qur'an is created, is hadith, created. And so Ma'mun was also convinced by them and he forced this upon everybody. Everyone had to accept this. People lost their lives. People were tortured over it. It's interesting. Even Ahmad bin Hanbal of the Sunni school, he, they say he, he underwent a lot of pressure because of this by the Khalifa. Because he wasn't giving in to that. Okay, but for us, when we listen to this, it doesn't seem like a very important subject. And personally, I don't think it is. And our imams didn't get involved. Like Imam Hadi alayhi salam, he didn't get too involved in this whole... Uh, debate and when people would ask him he would say it's not too important just forget about it don't get involved which is interesting anyway <clears throat> it says the question of whether the quran was created or not was being hotly debated by the muslims and was a source of acute acrimony and divisiveness divisiveness those who advocated the eternity of the quran did not support their position with sound reasoning with the result that some Muslims viewed the Qur'an as temporarily origin, originated. That means something that has been created later. It wasn't always there. While others regarded it as eternal. If the purpose of the Qur'an and its words is that... Okay, so now here Ayatollah Subhani tries to solve the problem. Okay, he wants to give his own opinion. So you got an idea. A very, very, that was a very brief history of it. But... The reality of the matter is that there was a whole inquisition uh, that happened over the period over a period of I don't know how many years. Not too long, but it was there for 10, 15, 20 years, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this Mihnatul Quran, this inquisition. People were actually inquired about it. And there was suppression that happened in that time. Anyway, anyway. Oh, look at that. He has a hadith here actually that Imam Qadim alayhi salam was asked. Is the Qur'an created or not? What was his answer? He said, all I'm going to tell you is, the Qur'an is kalamullah, is the word of God. So he didn't get involved in this whole theological debate of whether it's created or not. So that's a hadith we have here. Imam Hadi's time as well, we had this issue. So now, in 
if we look at this and we want to break it down and figure out if the Qur'an is hadith created or eternal, qadim, how do we f- solve this problem? Very simple, as a matter of fact. And to the Subhani, he says, okay, let's see, what does it mean? What do we mean by Qur'an, first of all? Right? Qur'an, he says, if, if when you say Qur'an, you mean the book of the Qur'an and the words within the Qur'an that are recited by us today, number one. Or if you mean the words that Jibra'il brought down to the Holy Prophet, number two. Or three, what you mean by Qur'an is the concepts that you find within the Qur'an, the ideas and messages that are in the Qur'an that you know have to do with the stories of the prophets and things like that, and the battles of the Holy Prophet and things like that. If any of these three is meant by the Qur'an, by the term Qur'an, then yes, this is something that has been created. It wasn't there all the time. yeah. For example, the one that has to do with the concepts of the battles of the Holy Prophet and the stories of other prophets and so on. These are things that these concepts have to do with those actual historical incidents. And it's very obvious these historical incidents are not eternal things. They happened through in the timeline on of history. So when these things happen on the timeline of history, that means they weren't always there. And if they're not always there, the concepts that reflect those historical events also weren't there from the beginning. Thus, this is something that was hadith, that was created later, if that's what you mean by Qur'an. So he says any of these three um, definitions of Qur'an will equal, very easy, very simply, will equal the Qur'an being something that has been created. But, he says, if you mean, what you mean by Qur'an is God's knowledge of the Qur'an and um of what is to come in the Qur'an, things like that. And you take it back to, and trace it back to God's knowledge, well yes, knowledge is one of the attributes of God's essence. And as we've said before, attributes of essence are eternal because they are part of the essence of God, which is eternal. You can't separate the attributes of the essence from the essence itself. The attributes of essence are the essence of God. So that's a very easy subject, it seems. But people were losing their lives over this and this inquisition that was happening in those times in the ninth century. Okay. Article number 40. Article number 40 is the truth of God. So what have we covered so far? We covered Kalamullah, what what number one, discussed that a little bit. Then one of those things that can be seen as God's word and God's speech is the Quran. So we talked about that and the Inquisition and Mihnatul Qur'an. Now we reach the second one that he wants to discuss, which is As-Sidq, God's truthfulness. Okay, God's truthfulness is also one of those qualities of, of action, of divine activity. It's not something that God has had from the get-go, from the beginning, eternally. Not because it, he, there was a time that God was not truthful. No, being truthful necessitates that there is another party there's someone else that you are in touch with you're communicating communicating to that you have to be truthful towards okay so you have to have somebody else out there somebody else out there equals something that's created not something that was eternal all right so if that's the case truthfulness is also not going to be eternal it doesn't have to do it's not one of the qualities of essence it's rather a quality of activity or action god if he's going to speak to others and you can tell that this sidq or truthfulness comes after the discussion of kalamullah kalamullah is god's speech since he's speaking to others it's not going to always be there so it's a it's one of the divine um, qualities of activity and action and if he's going to have speech there's someone who he's going to speak to which brings about the truthfulness now. So once again, this is very obvious and clear that this is that uh, sid and truthfulness is a quality not of essence, but a quality of action because it depends on there being someone that you actually communicate to. And if there has to be someone else, that someone else is not eternal for sure. So this uh, attribute or quality will be a quality of activity, a quality of action. Now, he talks about this a little bit, Ayatollah Subhani. Let me read off of the book. 
He says, ver now, truthfulness, I called it. The, the translation of the book says veracity. Okay? One of the attributes of divine activity or sifatul fi'l is veracity, sidq. That is to say, whatever he says is true. Why? What's your reason for this? Why does God have to be truthful? You know, this is the question that we have. Answer, the blemish of falsehood, right, does not tarnish his speech. The reason for this is clear. Why? Lying is the way of the, one, ignorant. Two, those in need. Three, the afflicted and the frightened. And God is utterly beyond all such conditions. In other words, lying is an abomination and God cannot be tainted by any evil. In other words, lying is something that is bad, inherently evil. And how are you going to give and attribute something that's inherently evil to God? Now, let me explain this a little bit. This is very important because this is not the only time that we're going to use this argument. God is truthful and doesn't lie. Actually, one time I was thinking to myself, like, who would ever like, even doubt that God tells the truth? But then there were, I have actually gotten this question from, from people, from youth, that, hey, what's the, uh, what's the guarantee that God doesn't lie to us? The answer that Ayatollah Subhani here he gave was, look, when you lie and not tell the truth, there's a reason for you not telling the truth. Okay? And um, I don't want to use lying opposite to truthfulness and sidq. Sometimes a person's not lying. They're just mistaken. So they're not sadiq. They're not, they're not on the truthful side, but it's not because they're lying. For example, they just, they're just ignorant. They're just ignorant. So a person lies, okay, or doesn't tell the truth of something, doesn't tell the reality because of one of three things according to Ayatollah Subhani. Number one, they're ignorant of the truth. So for example, the person says, yeah, it's uh, 5 o'clock right now, while it's, it's almost it's 7.30 right now. Turns out his watch, you know, the battery is dead on his watch. Yeah, he has a watch that's uh, analog, and the... Uh, what is it called? The watch has st stopped functioning. So those arms on the watch, or whatever they called, they have stopped at 5 o'clock. And this person looks at his watch, he said, tells you it's 5 o'clock while it's 7.30. Okay, this person didn't tell the truth. They, didn't, they weren't lying, they were mistaken. But at the end of the day, you can't say that this, what he said was truthful. He was sadiq. No, you can't say that. You can't say that what he said was truthful. Why? It was a result of his ignorance. True, it's not his fault that he was ignorant, but at the end of the day, he was ignorant. He, there was a knowledge out there that he lacked, and that is knowledge of the fact that it's 7.30 right now, not 5 o'clock. But we talk, this is impossible for God, because before this, we discussed that God has ilm, and his ilm encompasses everything. So, if you're going to say God is going to, not tell the truth sometimes or is going to be mistaken that entails that he is either ignorant that was proven disproven before or it's because no he is what was the word used here he is in need why do some people lie sometimes so a person i don't know bitcoin is going up for example and they want to invest in bitcoin yeah, although that, that, that hype has died out. But anyway, just example, using an example here. This person needs money to invest in Bitcoin. So what does he do? He go, although he has money to live his normal life, but he wants to make more money. So what does he do? He goes and asks relatives, hey, I need some help. I need money. Why do you need money? Oh yeah, I'm in need. I'm struggling. He t they, and they lend him some money. He takes that money for what? To invest in Bitcoin. Right? He needed money to invest, so he lied, didn't tell the truth, so he get a loan from others and money from others, borrow money. Yeah? So sometimes a person won't be truthful, won't tell the truth. Why? Because they need, they're in need. Yeah? But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that the case? That's not the case. Allah, we covered the second attribute of his essence was what? Qudra, power. A person who has power like what he has will never be in need so there's no need to lie
No need to tell, not tell the truth. So his knowledge says he's not ignorant. So he's not going to make a mistake the way others sometimes make a mistake and say something that's not true. Or he's not. In, he has. He's all powerful, and his power doesn't allow him to lie because he doesn't need to lie because he doesn't. He's not in need of anything to lie for it. That's number two. Number three. Sometimes people aren't in need, but they are afflicted and frightened. What is that all about, brothers and sisters? When a person they hold a gun to his head or her head, and they're like, "Hey, uh, did you?" Do you, are you the one who stole my money? Now, if this person even had stolen that person's money, they're going to say no. Why? Because there's a gun at their head. They're frightened. They want to save their life. No, I didn't steal your money. While the truth of the matter is that they did. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once again, is this the case? Is it even possible for Allah to not tell the truth as a result of being frightened? Na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah. No, that's impossible. Why? Once again. He's the all-powerful. How could he be in need or be frightened by others? They hold a gun to your head. Are you Shia? No, I'm not Shia, although you are. Well, you have to no choice but to tell, not to tell the truth because your life is in danger. But this is not applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this sidq and telling the truth and always being right, it's the case for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the case for Allah. Why? Because the root of lying or the root of, the root of being mistaken is one of those things that goes against him and his qualities of essence. Yeah? So it's impossible for him to not tell the truth. One. Two, Ayatollah Subhanahu used another argument as well. He said, not telling, lying is evil inherently. Everyone understands, let alone God. We understand that not telling the truth is something that's inherently bad. So, um, how can we, after knowing the perfection that God has, attribute to Him something like this? Something that's inherently bad, inherently evil. Yeah. So that's another argument he uses as well. He says God is higher than that to be attributed with anything that's inherently bad. All right, that's article number 40. Moving on to article number 41. Article number 41 talks about a third quality of activity or divine action. And that is hikmah, wisdom. <coughs> the wisdom of God. First, we have to understand what wisdom means. What's the definition of wisdom? What is meant by it? And then we're going to have a few verses where he... The, where he talks about the wisdom of God. Okay. What is hikmah or wisdom? He says, the meaning of God being wise is first, so there's two parts to this definition. Number one, his actions are brought to ultimate fruition in a perfect, complete, and definitive consummation. <laughs> Man, these are hard words that are used in this translation. Let me, let me, let me rephrase that. Let me reword that. That God, whatever He does, is going to be the best that that thing can be done. Okay, Everything that He does is going to be in its most perfect form. Number one. And it's going to you know, deliver that which is the purpose of that action. So that's one part of the definition. Part two of the definition. The second part of God's, uh, the definition of God's wisdom is that God doesn't do things and is higher than that. To do things that are in vain, there's no point in them. They're purposeless. So God's wisdom dictates. When God is going to do something, number one, it's going to be the best way it can be done. And number two, it's not going to be something that has no purpose. Everything God does has purpose and is done in the best fashion. That is God's wisdom. Because sometimes, brothers and sisters, we have the power to do certain things. But we still don't do the wisest, don't make the wisest choices. With God, it's different because He is the ultimate knowledge, has the ultimate knowledge, and enjoys the ultimate power. He has everything it takes to make the wisest choices, to do the wisest things, which are the best in the best form and have a purpose and and have a fruit to them. All right, give us some verses, Ayatollah Subhani, that talk about 
Just like the previous uh, articles that we had where you gave us some verses, give us some verses regarding this concept. These two parts of the definition of wisdom show us in the Quran verses that prove this point. Number one, he says, if you want, if, if you want a verse that talks about how he, everything he does is the, the right way to do it and is the perfect form to do it, Surah Naml verse 88. Sun Allah alladhi atqana kulla shay. Sun Allah alladhi atqana kulla shay. It's talking about the creation of God and God how he creates. It says the creation of God who does everything in a mutqan manner. Mutqan means like the, the best way it can be done. So the translation of Surah Naml 88 is the fashioning of God who perfecteth all things. That's a, that's some classical English right there. Alright. Sun Allah alladhi atqana kulla shay. So this verse shows that everything he does is perfect. Everything he does is in the best form. But who says that everything he does is um, purposeful? Maybe, because you can always do something that's purposeless, but do it in a perfect way, right? So for example, I'm just going to give an example. It's not a good example, but like, the you, you, you build a sandcastle. Alright, the purpose in a sandcastle is for it to get washed up by the sea in the end. <laughs> At the end of the day, the waves are going to come, <coughs> and they're going to destroy the sandcastle. So there's no purpose really in that. Or for example, I know, and I know some of you are going to tell me, no, there is a purpose, you know, just the fact that you take pleasure in building it, just because it's, it's a form of art, art is purposeful. I know, I'm just giving these as an example. I don't want to hurt the feelings of any sandcastle builders out there, okay? Or, I don't know, let's just say, for example, I don't know, I really don't know what example to use, because I don't know who, who's going to be listening to this later. But like, let's just say somebody, like, he, they can do, yo, they, they're master yo-yo, uh, they're a yo-yo master. And they do yo-yo perfectly. But what's the point in doing it? Okay, it's a form of art. It entertains people. But in the end, is anything really happening? Is anything really being accomplished here? Not really. So, But then you'll have the, the greatest yo-yo masters out there, the greatest magicians out there that are doing like things that they do in the best form. So something can be purposeless and not serve a proper purpose. But at the same time, be done in a perfect manner or a very good manner. So you gave us, Ayatollah Subhani, you gave us a verse that tells us that God does things in a perfect manner, but who says things that He does are all purposeful? He says, listen to this verse, Surah Sa'd, verse 28. Surah Sa'd, verses 28 says, مَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا That, look, we did not create the sky and the earth, and whatever is in, in between them, meaning everything. Batilan, in vain. In other words, everything that we created has a purpose. What is the purpose? Another verse says that Ayatollah Subhani hasn't brought here, of course, but there's another verse in the Quran that says, خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا Everything you find on the face of the earth, it's there for the per- for, to serve you. It's for you. I created it for you. Yeah, some people like, they say, oh, what's the point of, I don't know, bugs and cockroaches? Even cockroaches, they say, have a purpose. I don't want to Google it now, but like, I don't know, I've heard. I've heard that they say if you have a world without cockroaches in it, for 72 hours, people will die on that earth. Because why? These cockroaches are taking in all the bad bacteria and whatever germs out there that are out there, they absorb a lot of the bad stuff out there. I don't know how true that is. I've heard it before. Just giving it as an example. Everything I create is for the purpose of you. So I want to I do a little bit of a, you know, I want to link a few verses together. Ayatullah Subhani, the verse he brought to show that there is a purpose in the world. He brought this verse. ما خلقنا السماء والأرض وما بينهما باطلا. We did not create the heaven, the sky, and the earth, and everything in between it in vain. We didn't do it like that. There is a purpose to everything, to everything we created. Well, what is the purpose of everything? The verse that I just said. خلق لكم ما في الأرض جميعا. He created it for us, mankind, and the jinn, of course. خلق لكم ما في الأرض جميعا. Well. Okay, so you created everything for a purpose. That purpose is us. What's the purpose of us now? 
I created all of you to become obedient servants and abds of me. I created you to be my abds, my servants. So in other words, all of this creation is done for the purpose of us reaching the point of serving Him and being obedient servants of Him. Once that's accomplished, then we've secured everything and He's going to give us everything. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. And the door to tawbah is always open if we sometimes disobey Him. But we have to understand that this is the purpose of everything. So, purpose, Allah, when He does things, creates things, there's purpose behind them. One. Two, when He does things, He does them in the best manner. And it is the best way for that for that thing to reach the fruit that was the point of its creation. This equals God is wise. In other words, if you have somebody out there who has a purpose, has an end goal in mind, wants to achieve a goal, and the, what they, but what they do is not in line with the goal that they're after, this person is not wise. Right? It's not wise. A person who, for example, is thirsty in the desert, but does something that, I don't know, will bring about food for him or her, is not wise. Right? Because you were thirsty, not hungry. Think about it. I'll give you a good example for this. Jack and the Beanstalk. (laughs) Jack, in the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, was not wise why? Because mommy sent him, we all know the story, right? Mom, his mom sent him with the cow to sell the cow for food or for some money that they can use to, you know, to take care of themselves. He came back with like three magical beans. And so his mom was upset. Why was his mom upset? Because that's not the wise thing to do. You need something, you have a goal, you have a need, but to fulfill that need, you do something. You do something that it has nothing to do with fulfilling that need. That's not wise. So a wise person, a person who does something like that is not wise. Or a person who, um, you know, has the goal in mind and does the right thing to achieve that goal, but doesn't do the best thing to, to achieve that goal. So for example, I want to, you know, live comfortably in a home and I build a home for myself. But when I'm building it, I build it all crooked and stuff. And before you know it, a little shake by the earthquake, by an earthquake, brings down the whole house on my head when I'm sleeping in the middle of the night. This was not a wise thing to do. So both not doing things in a good fashion or not doing them in a way that, that, that you're that are in line with your goals, both of these are things that are unwise. So a wise person is one who doesn't fall into these mistakes. When we say Allah is wise, that is what is meant. That's one reasoning he brings for the fact that God has wisdom. This... Um, uh, quality of action another thing that he another argument that he uses he says that look god is <clears throat> god is ultimate perfection right we've already discussed this he says if god is ultimate perfection then for sure his action will also be and will also enjoy ultimate perfection very simple. And I think this is a very nice argument, actually. If God is ultimate perfection, then His action will also enjoy ultimate perfection. That means from every aspect, when you look at what He's doing, it makes sense. That equals wisdom. So that's another argument that He uses as well. Two arguments He used for this. Uh, for this, uh, Number one, He used verses of the Quran. Number two, He used rational argumentation as well. Very, I mean, this is very concise, of course, and we're not going into too much detail. But he used these two arguments to prove that God is all wise. All right, Alhamdulillah. This was the chapter on <coughs> the chapter on um, sifat al dhat and sifat al fi'l. We covered these two: the attributes of essence and the attributes of action. So we're done with that now. Attributes of essence and attributes of action. These were subcategories of the asifat al thubutiyah yeah or these or the um, affirmative qualities of god qualities that god actually has they are of these two types 
Next chapter, inshallah, next week, what we're going to get to is as-sifat as-salbiya now, the negated qualities of God, those qualities that he does not have. He gets into those, talks about those a little bit. Yeah, and then we have to move into a new category of God's attributes, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, keep us in your du'as until next, next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.